You made an intriguing guess, sir, in one of your books as to why we have underarm hair as a kind of sexual come on. But what can possibly be the evolutionary advantage to male pattern baldness? It's to avert jet lag so that you can have sun directly going into the pineal gland. Through... Isn't it? If, if my colleague Desmond Morris were here, he'd come up with half a dozen um, ingenious ideas. Maybe it's to intimidate rivals. Um, I, don't, I have absolutely no idea. Um, to the extent that male pattern baldness em, em, emerges after reproductive age, then the selection against it is obviously less severe because the genes for it have already got through to the next generation um, before whatever disadvantages... Uh, uh, yes, Desmond Morris has a book on the mail which came out just about two years ago. He's still living up the road from you, isn't he? Yes. Mm. Yeah. Um, forgive me, Richard, I know your field isn't climatology, but I wondered if you might reflect, and, and you too, Robin, perhaps, on the recent attacks on climate science and any parallels between the creation, um, evolution or creation versus science debate and, and people's understanding of science and how we communicate science. Well, I, I am aware that um, a, a, a new tactic among American creationists, and they're always coming up with new tactics as the previous one gets knocked down, that the latest tactic is indeed to ally themselves with climate change sceptics. And it's easier for them to, to use that because th that, that, that doesn't actually have a direct religious connection. And so since they want to make the political point that their uh, campaign against evolution is, for political reasons, it has to be non-religious. Of course, it is religious, but they want it to be represented as non-religious. They use climate change skepticism as another example and ally themselves with climate change skeptics. This is just, I think there's an article in the latest New Scientist about that, about this. Um, so that they can, um, as it were, ride along on the coattails of uh, climate change skepticism, which is getting um, increasingly um, covered. Yes, there's an article, well, three articles in the current edition of the Skeptical Inquirer, which is a fabulous mag magazine published in America. And they make the point that a whole number of people are linked to the anti-smoking, to, to, to the smoking lobby and various other groups which have got training from the PR companies. There's a whole very, very organized gang of people emanating out of the think tanks. And, of course, the uh, Creation Institute in Seattle is another think tank because those two people who run that were from a particular part of the... I think the Republican Party, very bright people with Harvard trained and so forth. But uh, there's no question it's a strong political movement and the characteristic is that they do not budge on what they say. It's always the mantra. You know, there's the Wendy test in this book. Just read those three pages about how they completely are unbudgeable when it comes to this stuff. So I think we're on that side now. Uh, hello. I have a... Hello. <laughs> Um, just a technical question about um, evolution. I was wondering if I could pick your brain about recent discoveries in the horizontal transfer of genetic information amongst bacteria and so on, and what implications that might have for conventional evolution. Yes, this is very interesting. Um, <laughs> why is that funny? He went like that. Oh, I see. <laughs> Are you um, in the field yourself? I'm just very happy that I asked you. Okay, thank you. Well um, uh, if you, if, if you study animals uh, as I do, then you're used to the idea that evolution is a constantly branching process. Um, well, when a, a species first diverges into two daughter species, that it goes through a period when it's possible for there to be gene exchange, when it's still possible to hybridize. And lions and tigers are kind of just beyond that stage now, and um, horses and donkeys and so on. They've just reached the stage where they can hybridize, but usually not in a fertile manner. And then when it goes diverge still further, then they don't even try to hybridize. And then from then on, there is never, ever, ever any more gene exchange. And so that makes the study of evolution rather nice and simple because it's always diverging. You never get coming together again once this original separation has taken place. But when you get to bacteria, all that's out of the window. And bac 